everyone, we're just going to give it another minute or so to let people join. can see our participant numbers clicking up, so that's good. So hello, everyone, and welcome to Nimue Exchange, which is a spinoff of our award-winning pandemic live stream series, BMA times Nimwa. Um, which was a collaboration between the Baltimore Museum of Art and the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And we had so much fun with it, we decided to um, kind of do this spin-off. And it is hosted by myself, Jenny Trainer. I'm the Associate Curator at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and my colleague, Senior Educator, Addie Ayoso. Hi, Addie. Hi, everybody. Hey, Jenny. So last month we spoke with Washington DC area artist and advocate Suzanne Brennan Furstenberg, whose installation project in America Remember, which honors those America has lost to the COVID-19 pandemic was on view at the National Mall last fall. Um, if you're in the area, you might've had a chance to see it. It was um, very moving, very beautiful. If you missed that episode, that live episode, uh, you can watch it on our YouTube channel and we will pop the link in the chat. So every month, uh, your fearless host from NIMWA or join a special guest to center women creatives. So we consider topics relevant to our world and offer insight into collaborations NIMWA is fostering while its building is closed for renovation, which I'm sure all of you know at this point. So during this time of change, we are excited to exchange ideas with our guests and viewers. And today, our special guest is Alex Libby, who's the Associate Curator of Northern Baroque painting at the National Gallery of Art here in Washington, DC. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you who are watching today, feel free to add your questions in the chat, which everyone can see, just FYI, or in the Q&A section, and we will do our best to address them today during the show. Uh, we are really excited to have Alex here today to talk a little bit more about 17th century Flemish painter Clara Peters. And we'll share the link about her in just a second in the chat. Before we jump in, let's share a bit of context for our viewers who may not be super familiar with the life and work of Clara Peters. Peters is the only Flemish woman known to have specialized in still life paintings as early as the first decade of the 17th century. While definite details concerning her life are scarce, records indicate that Peters was uh, baptized in Antwerp, Belgium in 1594 and married there in 1639. Uh, her earliest oil paintings date from 1607 and 1608. Um, they're small scale detailed images representing food and beverages. The skill with which this 14 year old artist at the time represented um, such pictures indicated that she may have been trained by a master painter. Although there is no documentary evidence of her education as an artist, scholars believe that Peters was a student of Osias Burt, Please correct me if I'm wrong, Alex and Jenny. Um, he was a noted still life painter in Antwerp. By the age of 18, uh, Peters was producing large, a large number of painstakingly detailed still lives, typically displaying groupings of valuable objects such as elaborately decorated metal goblets, gold coins, and exotic flowers. Her compositions often show these arrangements on narrow ledges seen from low vantage points against dark backgrounds. Nimwa is fortunate to have in its own collection two works by Peters. Um, this vibrant, abundant flower bouquet still life painted circa 1610, we believe, uh, and a personal favorite of mine, still life of fish and cat, made after 1620. Alex, one of the reasons we've asked you here today is because Nimwa's still life of fish and cat, which everyone can see on the screen, is currently on view at the National Gallery. This loan is part of a larger initiative in which some of NIMWA's most beloved works are on loan to area museums like the National Gallery here in DC and the Baltimore Museum of Art, while our building is closed for renovation. Sorry, 
I was looking for the unmute button. Um, so Alex, uh, we're going to chat a little bit about Clara Paters, who, um, as Addy mentioned, is a is a favorite uh, staff favorite at NIMWA, and um, I believe that at the National Gallery here in Washington, um, she's quickly becoming a favorite there as well. I hope. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about the Clara Paters in your collection? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really pleased to be here today. And yes, this is the Clara Paters at the National Gallery of Art, which was purchased only in 2018. Um, and, you know, Addie, you gave us a really nice summary of, of her biography. Um, this work uh, wonderfully is signed, but it's undated. Um, and we think it's probably to, to around 1610, which is the earlier part of her career, um, because that's about the time that she really becomes interested in and starts to incorporate floral imagery. Um, but this work is small. It's only about seven by five inches. Um, and what makes it really unusual in her oeuvre is this oval format that the bouquet fits um, inside, and then you have all these insects surrounding it. I mean, it's it's a sort of unusual for her. You never, well, beware of the world premiere. You never see this again. We don't have any other images by her extant or that we know of in which this is the format. But it's highly reminiscent of another artist um, um, at this time, and that's an artist um, named Jakob Hufnagel, or excuse me, Jors Hufnagel. Um, and I we believe we have a, oh yeah, perfect. Um, so Joris Hufnagel, um, this is an artist who um, is working in the 16th century. Um, and he's, one of his best known works is this four volume manuscript that we have at the National Gallery called The Four Elements. And it's really one of the museum's treasures. Um, and this is um, four different volumes, the four elements that are separated into um, air, earth, water, and then insects. They get their own, they get their own volume. And this one is really interesting um, because it's, it's a landmark in entomology. Like each of these images, and they're really small too, just a few inches high. The book is like maybe this big and on parchment um, and executed in this really exacting detail enhanced with silver and gold. And in about 80 cases, I believe it's 80, um, there are real dragonfly or butterfly wings that have been transferred um, through a process called lipidochromy um, to make it really shimmer. Um, and so this format is really reminiscent of what you're seeing in Pater's, right? This oval. And with hoof novel, it's wonderful because it's you get the sense of him looking through a lens almost, you know, you don't have the microscope invented until the 17th century, but there had to be some sort of lenses. Um, and it's, it's, it, it reminds you of, you know, as a, as a kid in science class, looking through a microscope, right? Like the, the, the oval of the, of the dish. So Hufnagel, um, his work really takes off thanks to the work of his son, Jakob, who is a printmaker. And it gets disseminated in this way. And it ultimately lands with this other artist named Jan van Kessel, who is an artist we also have represented well in our collection. And I think there's a next slide that shows one of our hoof noggles. And sorry, did you say hoof noggle was in Antwerp? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, and so is Jan van Kessel. <laughs> so, and you can see um, this yellow moth right here um, is, almost identical. And Jan van Kessel knew about Hufnagel's root work through his son, Jakob. Mm -hmm. So you have this really wonderful chain, but you're looking at Jan van Kessel. This is 1653. The mm -hmm. Hufnagel is much earlier. And so Clara Peters is, is much closer to Hufnagel than she is to van Kessel. Um, and so she is this really interesting bridge, um, I guess you could say. I mean, we're not really sure of what the, what, the, what the line is. It's not quite direct in that way, but she becomes this really interesting intermediary. So she's really tapping into that very early um, work by Hufnagel, but then she has this vase of flowers in the center. Um, mm -hmm. And I think well, if you go to the next slide, it comes back two hours. Yeah, there you go. Um, so she, you can see she has this hoof way of this cream background with these little bugs crawling all around it. 
And they occupy these different planes too. So while the beetle and the snail in the background look like they're crawling up the wall this way, the dragonfly looks like it's crawling across the wall this way. So there's this really strange play of dimension here. Yeah. Um, so she's in this way that we really didn't know until the national, until this painting surfaced, until we purchased it, that she's really interested as much in natural history, or she's she's part of this natural history conversation, as well as, you know, then she moves into these, you know, magnificent still lives, um, like the one that you have. Which which makes sense, right? Because here she is in, in Antwerp, um, and and this is where Hofnagel is, um, and and his drawings are being reproduced. So presumably they're widely available for people to see, artists to see and study. Yeah. And this, this closeness between scientific inquiry and what we consider to be, you know, fine art um, is really intriguing, I think. Um, oh, yeah. And particularly the fact that here is Clara Peters really um, in there at the, at the beginning of all of this. And we know from her other works that you know, she's painting in this style that was very prized at the time, you know, this super hyper realistic painting style, right? Um, but I think it's wonderful in this piece at the National Gallery that really demonstrates um, that, that more, maybe what we would think of as um, uh, scientific observation, right? Of these, of these. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that the the 16th century 17th century is like this is this is a moment um of the human interest in the empirical knowledge you know in the richness of nature um some colleagues and i at the national gallery two brilliant people i work with um brooks rich who's the associate curator of old master prints and stacy sell who's the curator of old master drawings the three of us are working on just this kind of exhibition that's about um, this moment, uh, we, it's called, um, well, tentatively called, so stay tuned, um, Little Beasts um, and the Dawn of Natural History. And that's because the Dutch word for creatures uh, is literally little beast, which is just a word we love, facious. Um, but, this, but this is the moment, right? This is the moment when, um, you know, interest in empirical knowledge and this theological belief that God was to be found in the richness of nature and this passion for classification and cataloging, you know, that there becomes this really deep interest in the natural world. Um, and at the same time, and specifically in Antwerp, global trade has expanded and Antwerp is a hub. Um, and you have extraordinary, you know, menageries and curiosity cabinets and academic collections. So this is all happening in this environment and, and Clara Peters is there. Speaking of that, do you happen to know if any of the flowers that she has depicted in this image are um, not indigenous to, mm. do you know if? That is a great question. And I don't know about their origins, but certain, you know, the, the trade, um, the global trade that is bringing different um, different varieties uh, of flora, I guess, and fauna. Um, that you know, the big gardens really start in the 17th century. Yeah. Um, the most famous one is Middleburg, but then there's also Leiden, and of course, that's the northern Netherlands. But Antwerp too. It must. I, I've done less less work on the gardens, the botanical gardens, and scientific gardens there. Um, but I, these are all spring blossoms and something that you find happen a lot in still life painting much later is these fantastic, you know, huge bouquets that have, you know, blossoms that don't bloom at the same time that, you know, alludes to all of their fantasy, but these are all spring blossoms and just being a very amateur gardener myself. <laughs> um, I do know that they all grow in Maryland. Um, <laughs> so I, and yet, I recognize them. largely. Yeah, these, I think these all would have been found by this time. Um, I think that's a really interesting point, Alex, because this Clara Peters, um, her work reminds me of and makes me think of other sort of Northern European um, painters and artists like 
Raquel Rausch, who was very much sort of on this level of creating these really vibrant and sort of fantastical mashups of bouquets, right? To me, like we have this really great example in our collection, but we wouldn't have seen those flowers all sort of blooming simultaneously or even in the same parts of the world. And then on the other extreme, we have Maria Sibylla Marian or Sibylla Marian who actually traveled um, from Amsterdam to Suriname to study flora and fauna in its natural environment. And she was very rigid about the ways in which she observed and replicated or um, painted or drew the natural world. So it's interesting to think about these artists on this continuum in relationship to how they wanted to represent the natural world. We have some really great questions actually. And one, um, and we'll get to all of them, I promise, but one that's sort of relevant to what we're talking about now from Robin is, are all of the insects in Pater's paintings native to the Netherlands or are they from other countries? Would she have been painting from live specimens or pictures of them? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, we can identify all of these, these bugs um, and, <sighs> Gosh, are they all native? I so here. Here's the thing: is that a lot of <laughs> people are bringing. I again, I don't know about how native they are, but she could have seen them, and that's because people are bringing specimen from all over. Um, and even for Hoofnagel, you know, when what was he able to observe versus what was he seeing in previous books and publications? There were publications about animals and insects prior to Hoofnagel. And, and you see some of those um, creatures recycled. <laughs> um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you look at, let's say a dolphin, you think none of these people ever actually saw a dolphin. <laughs> like this is, this is fully not what dolphins look like. Um, but with the insects, he's so, he's just so exacting in this way that you really think he has. Although again, there are these much earlier, um, volumes that go into great detail as well. So whether or not she's looking at some of these earlier volumes, whether or not she's actually looking at specimen, it's it's a little hard to say, um, but she certainly makes you think that she's seen them, right? I mean, the way that she animates these creatures is so convincing. Um, now, what was the second part of that question? <laughs> I don't think. Are they native to the Netherlands? What other countries? Yeah, I think so. She, other she saw them alive. I think there are some that she would have seen. And I will say that, like I said, this is seven by five inches. This is on copper, which is also a really wonderful um, mm -hmm. luminous support, but is also a support that was often used to front collector's cabinets. So what we mm -hmm. think is that this was probably inset into some kind of door or probably not a drawer, a door um, in which there were specimen, possibly, you know, floral, but also insect specimen. So it sort of um, announces what you're going to see when you, when you open the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was this real collecting craze at the time, right? People were compiling these cabinets full of um, all these, you know, fantastic things that they were seeing a lot for the first time that, you know, that were coming in from all these, um, um, colonies in, in, you know, these, these far-flung places, um, far-flung from the Netherlands, that is. Um, and so people collecting things like shells and insects even. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there was this real interest in the natural world again. Um, I think kind of as a reflection, as you mentioned before, Alex, right, of, of um, Kind of the the beauty of, of God's creations and the variety of them. Right. And just curiosity, you know, like the, it, it really, you know, people are extremely curious and, and art and curiosity and collecting it all, it all begins to overlap. Yeah. We have a couple of other questions that maybe we can touch on now actually as um, questions related to uh, Peter's professional life and sort of growth. And so there, one question is related to whether, she, uh, whether or not she was a member of the Guild of St. Luke. And then additionally, folks are curious a little bit more about where these artists, these naturalist artists, including Peter's, may have been shown uh, or sold. Like what was the market, the, mar the art market like um, when they were alive? 
That's that's a good question. Um, I I will just jump in really quick and say that um, what Alex just mentioned about this piece indicates that it was commissioned, right? Mm -hmm. Specific um, purpose. Now her other works. I'm going to skip ahead for a second, particularly the one in Numa's collection. This exists in a number of different versions. And so this suggests that these paintings um, of these, they're sometimes called breakfast scenes, um, were produced for the art market. That is, they were not done on commission, but they were done um, with the anticipation that they that they were popular and that they would sell. And the fact that she did this composition with slight variations a number of times um, kind of speaks to that. And what, Addie, what was the other part of that question? If she was a member of a guild, and specifically Susan asked the Guild of St. Luke. And what I have read about Peters was she wasn't, there's was no documentation that she was a member of a guild, but that scholarship may have changed since I've last done research on her. <clears throat> I don't think we have any indication of that. Um, we don't have a lot of archival evidence at all for Clara Peters. There are, there is a mention, I think, of a Clara Peters um, in in Antwerp, and, and I and I can't remember what the exact document is. It may or may not be the same Peters. So really, this is an instance of an artist whom really everything we know about her comes from her work. And luckily, a lot of her work is signed. Um, her her oeuvre is about at 38, 39 paintings total. Um, and a good, a good proportion of those are signed and some of them even dated. Um, so, you know, this is where, this is where art history comes in, right? We're, we're really, um, you know, looking closely at these works um, to, to find out anything we can uh, about her biography. One interesting thing is that her paintings don't show up in any of the inventories in Antwerp during her lifetime. And the first record we have of her works being in a collection is actually in Amsterdam, um, I believe in the 1630s. So how did that painting get there? Was she in the Northern Netherlands at some point? Did she have a, um, you know, kind of a middleman she was working with to sell her paintings in the North? What we do know also is she was the first, sorry, was the first artist to paint these still lives with fish that became then incredible, incredibly popular in the Northern Netherlands later in the 17th century. Um, so, she, she exerted, her paintings exerted a lot of influence, but we don't know if that was kind of secondary or if she was in the Northern Netherlands at some point, which, you know, would not be unheard of. We just don't have the documentation. Yeah, and I'll just say that, you know, it, it seems impossible that she didn't go to the Northern Netherlands. I mean, people traveled, artists traveled, women traveled. Um, and there's a lot of similarities, especially in some of her early work to, um, you know, Jan Bruegel, the elder, um, whose work was also, you know, <laughs> there. So like, there's, I, I think, I, I have to believe she traveled. I have to believe she traveled. And like you said, the market was ever reaching, you know, like there's, there was a really, you know, strong network of, um, of trade, of all fronts, you know, including, um, you know, artwork going, going north, going south, going to Italy, coming, you know, going to Spain. Going to Spain, yeah. I mean, I probably, you know, four of her best known works are in the Prado in Madrid. Um, and two of them were in that collection, I think, in the early 17th century. And then later in the century, two more were added. Um, so clearly, her work was really prized um, 
for for its quality, for its uh, you know verisimilitude, and yeah, I mean it. it it's really, she was really um, an important artist um, in a lot of different ways. And I think it's an interesting, you know, her, in her lifetime, there was this moment where <clears throat> art collecting became somewhat more democratized, right? There was these paintings, we talk about their size and ours is quite small as well. They're quite intimate, but there was more of a, a market for, for middle-class families and individuals to collect work. And I, it, there, this is tangentially connected, but I do want to ask a question that came up. Someone asked, with the image with the bugs, is there any sort of religious symbolism particular to specific insects? And I ask that in relation to what I just said, because I think at this time in art, art historically, we're moving away from artists focusing on religious subject matter, right? Into more sort of daily life or genre or still life works. But was there an infusion still of religious symbolism in her work. And I don't know if we know the answer to that, but I'll throw that to you and, and Alex. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, it's possibly yes. It's, I think it's, it, it tends to be yes and, um, and an interest in sort of the natural world and, you know, the beauty and fragility of optimism that these, these little creatures bring. Um, you know, so if you like, um, let's see, the um, dragonflies were often uh, sim signified to art. I mean, I think in some, or um, the snail, like a, a, a reminder to make haste slowly, um, the maybug symbolizing the transitory nature of life or the fly, a kind of parasitic because it eats at others' tables. So you can, you can infer kind of Christian symbolism within that. I mean, and the same thing with the flowers, right? The red anemone was often associated with the blood of Christ or the narcissus rebirth or the grape hyacinth, constancy and sincerity or the lily of the valley, purity and humility. So there's all these kinds of uh, meanings you could derive from these. Um, and <laughs> as we said, this sort of real curiosity about the natural world and you know, scientific inquiry. I mean, it was all together. It, it isn't yeah. either religious or scientific, you know, science being a discipline that, that comes formally later, right? Um, so it's sort of all of this bound up together. Yeah, yeah. And I would say even some, what I've read about some of her, her poop, food still lives is that we're seeing a real sense of it's a it's a snapshot of a, a moment in time and what sort of is valued our work doesn't include cheese but many of her works do and as a personal you know I'm very fond of cheese personally but as I read more about it and we see she has fish both freshwater and saltwater fish in a lot of her works there's some sort of, there's some indication and some scholars have suggested that's an indication not only of the bounty of the particular place in which she lived but also tells a little bit more about sort of the religious um, proclivities of, of, of Catholics, for instance, instance, who ate fish during Lent or who, you know, so it, it's interesting to think about sort of the infusion of potential religious um, customs within these still lives as well. Yeah, I think what's interesting to me is that you can kind of make of it what you like, you know, mm -hmm. that, it, that if you're someone who feels deeply religious, maybe this does have meaning to you on that level um or if you're someone who is part of the herring industry and you, <laughs> you know and you're and you're you know and you're fishing in that and that's a huge part of the economy um yeah. at this time this you know becomes a kind of surrogate of of your livelihood um mm -hmm. so you know we, we get to make we all get to make our own meaning i think which is what's really special about about these works yeah i i always when I look at the work of Peters, I don't, that doesn't jump out at me. That's not the first thing that jumps out at me. The first mm -hmm. thing that jumps out at me in, in this um, image is, is this one. I'm sorry, I keep skipping that picture. I promise I'll explain it in a minute. <laughs> I think that she is first and foremost concerned with um, showing off. Not, not in a bad way, but like, really demonstrating her skill and mm -hmm. in painting in particular, you know, if you just look at um, all the different textures she's managed to cram into this one small painting, right? You have the, 
that great kind of sheen on the fish. Um, you have the roughness of that terracotta colander. You have the reflection on the pewter plate, the translucent the shrimp in the foreground, uh, the fur of the cat. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think she's really just going all out. Um, and for me, this image with the bugs calls to mind, right? That kind of, uh, you know, paragone, that kind of um, triumph of painting over nature, right? And mm -hmm. a fly in particular, going back to the, the anecdote from antiquity, um, you know, about who could paint the, the more realistic painting and the artist that one was the one that painted the fly on it because the other artist thought it was real. Um, mm -hmm. So not to say that there isn't, you know, there might not be uh, religious symbolism wrapped up in any of this, but as Alex mentioned, it, you know, it is, it can be that and, um, mm -hmm. and this kind of um, demonstration of skill as well. Yeah. Well, I have to ask, let's chat a little bit about why our Clara Paters is at the National Gallery right now, right? We are, as everyone knows by now, probably as Jenny mentioned earlier, that the museum, NUMWA is closed until uh, probably fall of 2023 for a major renovation. So we are fortunate to work with a couple of museums in the DC area to lend some of our most prized works so that folks can, so they can be seen and appreciated while the museum is closed for renovation. So I'm curious, Alex, you could talk a little bit more about why the National Gallery borrowed this work. Um, the, the galleries borrowed several of our really important pieces in our collection, but why the, why the painters? Um, well, you know, it's a, it's an incredibly special opportunity. First of all, thank you for letting us <laughs> house these wonderful treasures of yours um, for the time that we get to be their, their custodians. It's really a treat for us. Um, and it's, it's just a, an extraordinary opportunity for us to showcase artists that should be in our collection in greater numbers, you know, and that we are extremely lucky. This region is so lucky to Mrs. Halliday for the foresight she had. Um, so Claire Pater should be in our collection, you know, <laughs> there should be, there should be more um, art by women in our collection, frankly. Um, so this, this was, um, this was special for that reason, but, and yes, and it's just a great painting. I mean, like Ginny said, the, the, the scales of the fish, the sort of whale sliminess of the eel, the, you know, these, these little, um, well, I guess there are the antennae on the shrimp, you know, all of these. It's such a skillful painting. The, she's so evocative in her textures, um, even the clay of the pot, right? Like it's it's a really interesting piece. We have nothing like this. Um, and it helps us really think about the different kinds of art that is being produced at this time. Um, the cat though, I don't know. I don't know about that cat, I gotta say. <laughs> It is, we, cats, we have to, were her, cats were not her strong suit. I well, I will say that cats weren't many people's strong suit. We have a, um, a Hendrik Goltzius in the adjacent room where we've hung this and it is, it is not convincing. Um, and it is, it was just extremely difficult, I think, to um, convey life in animals specifically yeah. um, for artists of this time. Um, but it's one of the better cats I've seen, I have to say. Yeah, it's uh, it looks like a mean cat, like you know. <laughs> I wouldn't want to mess with that cat. Definitely introduces a kind of sense of menacing, maybe forebodings, but yeah, and also that impression of of uh, I forget who mentioned it earlier, but you know, a moment. It's a moment in time. Yeah. In the next moment, that cat's going to be off the counter with the fish. I am so taken, this work I love, it's one of my favorites. It's quite small, we've talked about, and I think many people might walk by and not give it the moment it deserves, but there's something really um, real, sort of meditative or, or sort of inviting about its monochrome sort of palette. And I also, I cannot get over her reflections. Her rendering of reflection is just spectacular. I mean, if you look at the the dish on the bottom left of the composition, and even you know the the oyster. There's sort of this sort of um, sort of light that it's it's receiving, and I 
I wish we don't in our collection, but it, I it just invite anyone when you're at museums and you see Clara Pater's name on a label, spend some time with these works. They they really reveal so much with, with time spent. She was known, as Ginny mentioned, she signed many of her works. She also infused or included self-portraits in reflections in a lot of her pieces. Not the case for our works or for the National Galleries, but you will be rewarded if you take a close look at some of her works, especially in reflections of bubbles, um, in the reflections of metal, um, like goblets. Um, sometimes her, I mean, it's the minuscule self-portraits. She was an amazing painter. It's, it's quite... It's quite, it's quite incredible what she was able to accomplish. Yeah, it was, like I said, it's all, it's all about her skill. And I love the fact that she does include those kind of um, hidden self portraits. It's just another way of, you know, asserting that like, I, I did this, right? This is, this is me, I did this. Um, I just wanted to go back to this picture that I kept skipping over. Um, um, Alex mentioned uh, our founder, Mrs. Holliday, who founded the National Museum of Women in the Arts uh, in 1987. We opened our doors. And here is an image of Mrs. Holliday's house in Georgetown. And you can see the Clara Pater's hanging on the wall here. So before the museum opened, uh, many of the works that are now in our collection were hanging in her house. And she would open her house and invite people in to see them. And Clara Pater's especially um, is important for our institutional history because it is the art of Clara Pater's that really spurred Mr. and Mrs. Holliday to begin collecting the art of women because they saw the art of Clara Pater's when they were traveling through Europe, um, I believe in the 19, early 1970s, uh, they encountered her work in Vienna and in Madrid and were, you know, bowled over by her work because they're fantastic. And they, you know, they couldn't find out any information about this artist who happened to be a woman. And, and they really, you know, realized that, hey, there, there's not a lot of information about any of these historical women artists out there. And so that's when they kind of started collecting um, predominantly at that point historical work by women artists. And really, you know, raising this issue uh, in the public sphere, and of course, led to the founding of the museum. So, Clara Pater's uh, a fantastic artist, and also we have her to thank for the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I wonder what she would think about that. <laughs> I just to build on what you said, Jenny. We did have a question about uh, it's. Uh, Emma says, it's really sad. Why isn't there more information about Peters? And I think we've touched on sort of several reasons for that over our conversation. But I, I do, you know, just to add a little more depth to what Ginny, depth isn't the right word, it's just share a little bit more information. When Mr. and Mrs. Holiday started searching for information about women artists, they turned to the standard text of the time, which any of us who studied art history probably has read Jansen's History of Art or loved it from class to class. And when they looked for Clara Peters to learn more about the artist, they, there was nothing in uh, Jansen's History of Art about her. And furthermore, they did more digging and realized there was no information about a single woman artist in this tome of a book. And there wasn't until I think the year the museum opened, it was the first issue of Jansen's History of Art that it even included a mention of a woman artist. So I think it's important for folks to know sort of why. I mean, historically, we don't have a lot of record, uh, contemporaneous to her life, we don't have a lot of records of her, but then she she was lost to history because she just, as a, as a woman artist, wasn't written much about and wasn't focused on in terms of sort of developing a traditional Western canon of art history. Yeah, I think this is, you know, this is the, uh, the issue surrounding a lot of early modern women artists is, you know, not only is there a lack of archival documentation frequently, not all the time, but frequently there is, but then also, you know, even if there is, Nobody has looked for it, um, you know, let's say in the past hundred years or so, well, until let's say until the 1970s when second wave feminism and, 
and the women's art movement got going. Um, but I think, you know, it's important to not only, you know, recover these stories to the extent that we can, but to um, fold them into our existing art historical framework. Um, and so we understand um, how artists like Peters, you know, depended on the artists that came before her and then influenced those who came after her, just like we would for, you know, for any artist. Yeah, you know, I was I was struck um, by one of your presentations, Ginny, a, a while ago, um, when you did the market survey of the work of Rachel Rouse and um, Bill and Von Alst, right? or no, was it Von Alst? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, Von Alst. Um, and into the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, that their prices are, her prices are consistently high. So the idea is that it's not that the market forgot these artists it's that the scholarship wasn't writing about them you know the scholars weren't writing about them so there's an erasure there that that occurs um and I think yeah I mean wonderful that um that finally you know you've got great institutions like the Prado doing an exhibition you know it happened in 2014 12 14 oh no it was it was more recent than that um okay. 17? I think so. time is a blur these days, but I know, you know yes. Is. <laughs> but the, 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 whatever the 200th anniversary of the Prado was, that was the year okay. they had the first show of women artists. Their first, women artists. That was their yeah. first monographic exhibition on women artists. Yeah. So, you know, great news. It's happening, you know. <laughs> and um and people are, are realizing that there's just an extraordinary wealth of, of, you know, artists, of practitioners, and beyond painters too, right? I mean, when we really expand what we think of what the canon and has defined as art, what Jansen defined as art, mm -hmm. you know, all of those years ago, that if you start to include paperwork and lace work and embroidery and, um, you know, just miniatures and so many other kinds that, you know, likely will find a lot more people, you know, we, we just need to start looking, you know, you see so many times these superlatives, like the first woman to do this. Well, maybe, you know, have we looked for more? And the, the fact remains too, that quite often, um, you know, these, these artists, women, were known in their lifetimes and they were written about and they were um, lauded for their work. And so even, you know, even having that paper trail, so to speak, didn't necessarily protect them from eventually being um, omitted from art history. Um, so yeah, it's, there's obviously a lot more work to be done. Mm -hmm. I love about art history. It's always kind of growing and changing and um, almost like, you know, detective work in a way, which is always fun. I have, uh, we are sort of, we have a couple of minutes left. We want to thank everyone for joining us and hang on because if there are any other questions, feel free to add them to the chat or the Q&A. There's one that I've been sitting on for a little bit that I want to, to bring it back. Um, and the question was from someone anonymous. Is there any indication why Clara Peters was active for such a short period of time? What was, how long was she really, do we think was she was active? I mean, she began painting at a very young age, um, but I'm just, well, there's wondering a little bit more about sort of the start and end point of her career. Hmm. Do you want to take that, Alex? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> you know, sorry to stump you, Alex. <laughs> it, it, I think the answer is just, it's complicated by the, the fact that maybe she did paint longer and we just don't know because those works are extant. Maybe um, those works have been misattributed. Mm -hmm. um, like that's the kind of thing that happens. I mean, for example, at Nimwa, you did that when you when you did your beautiful show, Ginny, you had that very late Judith Leister painting. And you know, the narrative mm -hmm. until that point was, well, you know, Judith Leister got married and stopped painting. Mm. You know, and I think what you said so nicely is not so fast. That's, you know, you cannot say that. And also now we have this painting 
a self-portrait from the very end of her career. So was she not signing? Was she working, you know, with Molinar? Was she, was she producing independently? You know, like there's, there's so many nuances um, or possibilities, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. to answer that question. Um, I'm sorry that that, Im that painting is not in this particular image of the exhibition, but <laughs> oh yeah, but this is this is an installation shot of your great of your great show. Um, so, I guess one question is, did she only paint for a little while? Maybe. If so, mm -hmm. is it possible that because family obligations, you know, uh, occupied her time? Possibly, you know. Um, but then you have an artist like Rachel Rouse who had 11 children and painted until she was, you know, 80. Mm -hmm. um, but she was also very wealthy and probably had lots of childcare, you know? <laughs> so did Clara painters have lots of children and no childcare? Maybe. Um, we just can't say, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, um, Jenny, you said nicely um, before, before we, um, when we were talking before this, this presentation, we put this contemporary lens and we fill in the blanks, you know, oh, well, she must have gotten married and stopped painting. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, sure. Could be. Um, but that applies to, to male artists as well. Sometimes, you know, I think it was uh, one example uh, that I can think of is Hieronymus Bosch, you know, married up, <laughs> married very wealthy. And so he stopped painting. He didn't have to paint anymore. Um, and so, yeah, I think we have to be very careful about making assumptions. I think for some reason we feel much more, we collectively society, as art historians maybe, feel much more comfortable making assumptions about women, early modern women. Um, you know, that, oh yeah, she got married and, you know, she didn't have time to paint anymore. I think we have to be very careful about making uh, statements like that, lest they be taken as, um, you know, scripture by yeah. art historians. Mm -hmm. I feel we like we could talk about this for days, <laughs> right? Like it's such an interesting topic. Um, and I wanna be mindful of time. And I just wanna say thanks again to Alex for spending time with us today. Um, and I hope everyone who is listening and watching We'll visit the National Gallery either in person or online, and I'll share the link in the chat. Yes, and mark your calendar for our next episode of Nimue Exchange, which will be Tuesday, February 8th at noon Eastern time. We are going to be speaking to artist Barbara Takanaga about her work, which is featured in the upcoming exhibition, Positive Fragmentation from the collection of Jordan D. Schnitzer and his family foundation curated by yours truly. Uh, it will be on view at the American University Art Museum here in Washington, DC from January 29th through May 22nd. Um, there are uh, kind of special opening hours because of uh, COVID. So check the uh, AU website for the, for the most updated of those. Again, Alex, thank you so much for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure and it was so much fun. I know, thank you Thanks, for having Alex. me. Thank you so much. It was so nice much. to talk to you. You too, Addie, and thank you for the paintings. They're just, they're really, it's very we'll special. We'll want them back. <laughs> we'll, we'll send them home, but it's really special for us to have them, and we're, we're just so pleased, so thank you. Of course. Yes. It was exciting. I actually went to the gallery um, right after, between Christmas and New Year's, and I got to see some of our works hanging in your galleries, and it's just wonderful to see them in a new place and having conversations with different objects, so I hope folks have a chance if they're in the D.C. area to, to go check it out. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today and we hope you will join us in February. I'm excited to talk to Barbara to learn more about your show, Jenny. And also we have a, a little bit of a surprise for our folks about Barbara's work. So we hope you will join us. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Bye. Everybody. Hey, bye.